In 1945, the United States conducted a test of an atomic bomb called the Trinity Test. Here's the footage, and as you can see, it is a really big explosion. But the question is, how much energy is in that explosion? It turns out that the United States did not release all of the data about the explosion. They only released this video. And as a result, if you're in the world and you want to know how big of the explosion was, you're going to have to do some sort of mathematics modeling to estimate that. A British physicist called Sir G.I. Taylor did such a mathematics model using an extremely simple technique called dimensional analysis that I'm going to introduce to you in this particular video. What he did was that he looked at a lot of screenshots from this video. Indeed, a, a series of stills was released as well, and they look like this. And if you look at one of these stills, you can see that there is a distance recorded from that distance, you can figure out what the radius of this approximately hemisphere-sized explosion was. And there's also times released. So you can know that at any given time, what is the radius? So what this physicist first did was he collected all of these different radiuses and times. And from that, you can actually graph and you can show what the relationship between radius and time is. But the problem here is we don't yet know what the energy is. And the approach that he took was to say that this radius depends on perhaps many different variables. Clearly, it depends on time, but it also depends on the energy of the explosion. A bigger explosion would have a different relationship between the radius and the time. And it also depends on perhaps many other physical properties. One that he studied was the density of air. If you have the air being more dense, that's going to sort of resist the explosion a little bit more. So what you get out of this is that the radius is some function of time, of energy, and density. And the question for us, our goal is, what is that function? And so what we're going to do in this video is we're going to use dimensional analysis to try and describe what that function must look like, because at the very least, it has to have the right units. And that's going to be the grounding for dimensional analysis. So, as stated, our goal is to describe the radius in terms of time, energy, and density. And I can give some names for these, I'll just call this R is just a function f of the t, e, and we use the symbol rho for density. And then our big question is, well, what actually is that function f? That's what we're going to use dimensional analysis to try to analyze what the specific function actually is. So it's a bit of a background. There are seven fundamental dimensions. I don't mean dimensions like spatial dimensions, I mean dimensions like units. So for example, we have mass, length, and time. Those are the most familiar ones. We also have electric current. We have temperature. We have this, the pure amount of something and something called luminous intensity. Each of those seven fundamental dimensions gets a particular named unit in the SI unit system. So kilograms, meters, seconds, and so on. And then the idea is if you have some other physical property, like say velocity, well, velocity is a distance over time. Its units are meters per second. So velocity can be written in terms of these seven fundamental ones, as can force, as can energy, and so on. One other piece of notation is called square bracket notation. And basically, the way square bracket notation works is that if you have some particular quantity, like 76 meters, it just gets rid of the 76 and only says whatever the units are, it says meters. So this square bracket notation is just notation to say, I don't care about the magnitude, I just care about what is the unit of this thing that I'm studying. For instance, if you go back to velocity, we could say, what is the dimension of velocity? Well, it's the dimension of distance over the dimension of time, it's meters per second in SI units. Okay, so that's just some background. Now let's return to the problem we were studying. We wanted an r in terms of some function of t, e, and the density rho. So if I put those up there, I can say what their units are. So for distance, its units is meters. For time, it's seconds. For energy, which is like force times distance, force is mass times acceleration, so kilograms, meters per second squared, that times another meters, this is going to give you the energy, so kilogram meters squared per second squared this is the units for energy. And then units for density, we're asking how much stuff per unit volume, so kilograms per meters cubed. Those are the dimensions of all the different properties, and if we use the square bracket notation, for example, we could say that the dimension of R is meters and so on. 
Now, why are we doing this? The point is that I don't know what that function f is, but it has to have the right dimension. It has to have the right units. So what I want to do is figure out ways that I can combine the t, the e, and the rho, the time, the energy, and the density, such that what I get out of it is the right units. It's the units for meters for the dimension of the radius. Okay, so let's try solving this then. Our first step is to say that the dimension of that radius must be the dimension written as some combination, some product of powers of the time to an a, the energy to a b, and the density to a c. So our goal is to figure out, well, what is the a, b, and c such that if we write our r as this particular combination, then the dimensions match. Notice I'm not saying the magnitudes match, I'm just talking about the units. So what I have here is some equations. If I expand this out, okay, so the dimension of radius was just meters. Then the dimension of time was seconds, so I've got seconds to some power. In for the energy, I put in that kilograms, meters squared per second squared, raise that all to the power of b, and likewise for the density. Now I'm going to take this equation and I'm going to group all the seconds together, group all the kilograms together, and group all the meters together in this way. So it's just those three fundamental dimensions raised to different powers. Now this is one equation, but in truth it's really three equations. One where I look at the exponents for the seconds, one where I look at the exponents for the meters, and one where I look at the exponents for the kilograms. And so my next step is going to compare the powers, the so-called light powers for each of those three fundamental ones. And I'm going to get three different equations. First of all, if I compare the powers for meters on the left-hand side, I just get 1. And then on the right-hand side, when I look at the power over m, it's 2m minus 3c. Next up, if I look at seconds on the left-hand side, there is no second, so its power is seconds to the 0. And then on the right-hand side, it was an a minus 2b is the power of seconds. And likewise, I can look at kilograms, I get similarly a 0 on the left-hand side, there is no kilograms there, is equal to a b plus c. So, what we've done is we've come up with a linear system of equations. Three equations, three unknowns, and we can solve these equations. We, there's multiple ways to solve these ones, but one way to do it is look at that third equation, which tells you that b is minus c. You then can take that third equation, plug it into the first equation. This is going to tell you that 1 is equal to 2 times b, or 2 times minus c, minus 3c, and as a result of this, you're going to get c is negative 1 -fifth. We then know already that b is just the negative of that, and so b is equal to positive one-fifth. And then if I take this result and put it into the second equation, I can finally solve out for a, so a minus two, and then I plug in that value of b, that value one-fifth, and this is gonna tell me that a is two-fifths. In general, if these systems of linear equations were more complicated, you could go and apply the techniques of linear algebra, but when it's simple like this, we can just sort of do ad hoc solving to solve this system of equations. Anyways, well, what's the point of this? So remember what we were doing. We were trying to write r as a combination of the t, the e, and the density, and we were trying to make those dimensions match. Now we know the power that has to work, and so what do we have is that the dimension of r can be written as the dimension of this combined expression, t to the two-fifths, e to the one-fifths, and rho to the minus one-fifths, where I take the one-fifths and I pull it out of the brackets here. So this tells me the structure to which f must be. Indeed, if I want to think about the actual r, so not just the dimensions, but where I care about its magnitude, it's some constant, one that I admittedly do not know, some constant, and then multiplied by this expression, this t squared e over the density to the one-fifth. And that gives me a really nice prediction for the shape of this graph. So, if I look at this particular equation, there's this constant. This is something I do not currently know. There's the density, and in our case, because we're talking about the atmosphere, the density is something we can go and compute. It actually is known as 1.25 kilograms per meters cubed, approximately. Of course, there's slight fluctuations in the density, depending on where you are on the Earth, but this is approximately it. Then I can look at the r and the t, and if you recall back at the beginning, r and t were the things we knew. That was the things that Taylor was able to read off from all of the photographs. And then the thing that we want to compute out, that is our energy. That's the last remaining piece of the puzzle. So if I can get the constant, then I'll be able to compute out what the energy is, because everything else is known. So now the question turns to how do you find that constant? 
And the idea is now we need to turn to experiments to be able to figure out what that constant is. So what he did was he tested actual explosions, much, much smaller explosions, ones that could be done just sort of outside in your backyard if you wish. But he looked at other explosions, ones that could be tested, and figured out their relationship between the radius and the time, given a known energy, and of course the air density is also known. And as a result of these experiments that he was able to conduct with very small bombs, he was able to come up with an estimate for that constant for the very small bombs. So then the question becomes, how does that constant for the small bombs relate to the constant for this atomic bomb? Well, if you do the math and compute it out, using the constant that he got, you would get 19.2 kilotons for the size of the atomic bomb. But when the data was eventually declassified, the actual answer was 21 kilotons. So G.I. Taylor was able to get a shockingly close answer by doing very simple mathematics, just dimensional analysis, and then deciding the value of that constant by doing experiments with much smaller explosions. This is the constellation Cassiopeia, and what we have here, this sort of red explosion, is the Tycho supernova. This is a supernova that astronomers back in the 1500s were able to see. There was just one year where a star appeared in the constellation Cassiopeia, and then a year or two later it had faded away and we couldn't see it. And now that we have more accurate telescopes that can look at these things, we can still see its remnants today. A supernova is an enormous explosion. It's like a nuclear bomb, but on steroids. This is an exploding star. And so the question is, for this little formula that we computed by doing little experiments to figure out what the constant was and dimensional analysis to figure out what the general structure was, does that still hold for explosions that are as big as this? Well, it turns out that it's remarkably accurate. Indeed, if you look at this formula we had, where I put the coefficient of 1 out the front, then if you rearrange that for time, so I'm not doing anything, just rearranging it for time, you get the square root of r to the fifth rho over the energy, then you can predict the time when the ancient astronomers would have seen this supernova. Indeed, many of these constants are things that astronomers can go in and compute, so the radius is known, it's sort of 33 light years, so this enormously large explosion. The energy is, of course, enormous, we're talking about an exploding star, so there's estimates for how big that energy is. And likewise, the density, because it's a star but now spread out over 33 light years, the density is extremely small. So nevertheless, we have these three constants. You can plug them in, and this data was taken a few years ago. So if you get 453 years and subtract it from when this data was taken, you get 1561 as the year when the supernova allegedly exploded. Now, this isn't completely accurate, but the actual year is 1572. And so much like for the nuclear bomb, where it, yes, admittedly was an approximation, but nevertheless, a really good one that was able to predict not just a nuclear bomb based on these small experiments that determined the constant, but also one of the largest bombs we could possibly imagine, an exploding star. If you have a question about this video, leave it down in the comments below. If you like the video, we're all mathematicians here, we know that YouTube appreciates algorithms, so give the video a like for the YouTube algorithm, and I'll do some more math in the next video.